So let's, let's pray. Thank you, God, for this opportunity to give back a, a portion to you of what you've given to us. And, and we just honor you and praise you uh, with these gifts. And uh, may it be used to, uh, to advance your kingdom, Lord. And we just pray this in your name. Amen. So for those of you who are wondering where Pastor Joe is, <clears throat> he is uh, uh, getting to uh, enjoy his new grandson right now. And so I know uh, we've, we've heard him uh, talk a, a lot about uh, uh, anticipating having a grandson and, and enjoying a grandson, and not that he doesn't appreciate it, granddaughters, but I, I, he, uh, he's been really looking forward to this, so uh, just pray that it's a very blessed week for, for him as he uh, enjoys that, and, and then they'll be going to Kansas and be back this next week. So, uh, good morning. And, uh, and for those of you who do not know who I am, I'm Jonathan Reardon. Um, Pastor Joe asked me to uh, preach last week and this week. Uh, normally, uh, I, I do Sunday school or, or help out in, in some other uh, way. And uh, so um, when he asked me, I... Uh, I had the the idea uh, for for last week that came right away and 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 then I was like, okay, God, I need <clears throat> I need a topic for the second week and and you start to get nervous and you're like, all right, Lord, uh, what what do you want me to talk about? And eventually a question came to mind and. Uh, and the, the question is, are you satisfied? And so this time of year starts to get busy with lots of events and preparations for summer. Uh, you have graduations. I know I, I have one this Friday. Uh, and grad parties, not, not me, myself. I'm not graduating. My, my nephew, believe it or not, uh, which I, I still remember you know, I, I won't go into all the details, but I remember when he was born and and uh, and uh, babysitting him when he was just a couple of years old over Christmas break, and I'm like, this kid is graduating. How is the time flying? <laughs> and uh, we also have garden planning and garden preparation. You have yard work and all the projects that had to wait for warmer days. Um, life gets busy and you go about the days moving from one task to the next. Memorial Day, that's uh, coming up next weekend. It, it also signifies, Memorial Day also signifies an unofficial start to grilling and camping season, you know, and uh, time for uh, spending a little extra uh, time with your family, uh, doing events and that. Um, a lot of families will have reunions and, and that over the, the summer months. One activity leads to the next, and sometimes it seems like you hurry up to relax and enjoy the few days of summer that we receive. And, you know, if you are, are working at at a job where you have weekends off, if rain uh, comes on the forecast for the weekend, it can put a damper on our spirits. Uh, we strive to get everything done that uh, we, we do to make us happy or to fulfill some desire that we have. Not everything we do is, is done for, for pleasure, you know, uh, and one example of that is, is gardening. We do receive a lot of joy and fulfillment in, in working out in the garden and, and harvesting. 
but it's also a great source of provision of quality food. Um, so, but even if we checked off every box that we had for the summer months, if we put everything on the list and said, okay, got that done, that done, that done, we should ask the question if it has satisfied us. Satisfaction. How do you define a word like that? And I'm not going to define it, uh, but rather let uh, Mr. Noah Webster define it in his 1828 dictionary. He defines it as the state of mind which results from full gratification of desire. The state of mind which results from full gratification of desire. Repose of mind or contentment with present possession and enjoyment. To be completely satisfied means that our desires have been met and that we are now at a level of peace. Considering all the activities that we have planned or will do when they are over, do they bring satisfaction? I know that for myself, if I finish a big project, I am pleased with it and it brings satisfaction, but it, it lasts for a short period of time. Can we find lasting satisfaction? If so, how can we find the deep and lasting satisfaction? Can we find lasting satisfaction that will tra transcend the tr satisfactions of accomplished tasks? And so we're going to start uh, by reading God's word this morning. And so we'll stand for the reading of God's word. And we'll turn to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, and I'm reading out of the NIV. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Lord God, help us to understand your word and what, what it has to say about what brings about satisfaction, Lord. We, Holy Spirit, just open our minds to receive your word this morning. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And I wanted to read this in a few other translations. And uh, King James reads this way, Blessed are they which do hunger, and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Uh, you know, whenever you think of the word shall or will, uh, I always remember uh, this, this one teacher who is talking about electrical code, and, and it says, outlets shall be this far from the floor. It means if you put it lower than that, when they're coming through the inspection, they're going to say, all right, you got to fix that. It has to be raised up to, to meet the code. It shall be this. And so when those that are hungry and thirsting for righteousness, they shall be, it's, it's certain, uh, they shall be filled. NASB reads this way, ESV is the same. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. God uh, blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. That's the New Living Translation. The Amplified reads this way, Blessed, joyful, nourished by God's goodness, are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who actively seek right standing with God, for they will be completely satisfied. 
And I, I looked up the Greek uh, for this verse, and I don't want to get into uh, uh, trying to pronounce these words, but we see that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and it's a word that comes for equity, specifically justification, will be fed, satisfied. And um, fatten is another word, and it comes from a root of a word meaning to fodder, um, to, to gorge. It is an example of, of fodder. Righteousness, and I'm going to go on to define righteousness here before we start putting this verse back together. Righteousness, as defined by Noah Webster, is just. Or, according to the divine law. And the definition of right, uh, So that was the definition of righteous. Righteousness is purity of heart and restitute of life. Conformity of heart and life to the divine law. So righteousness, we're conforming our heart and our life to the divine law. So, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for a conforming of, of heart and life to divine law, for they will be satisfied. And, and so, piecing this verse back together, we, we see that those who live their lives in accordance with God's law, having the purity of heart and not habitually sinning, sinning will be satisfied. And um, when, we were, when I was looking in, in Strong's uh, for that word satisfy, it, it mentioned fodder. And if you have ever seen a horse or a cow or a goat uh, or if, has anybody ever seen uh, one of these animals eat fodder? And so maybe you don't know what fodder is. Fodder is hay or straw. It uh, has the connotation that they're not going out to pasture, but it's uh, set, set before them. Um, it, it specifically is referring to stationary feeding. And um, it, when an animal is eating fodder, uh, we used to have goats and, and uh, we would bring them in at night and put the, the hay in their pen and they would sit there and eat and eat and eat and eat and they would eat until you would see their stomachs. Uh, you would be like, oh yeah, that's, that's extending out a little bit there. And, and then they would go lay down and you would see them starting to chew their cud and they the expression on their face was one of just like, ah, oh, there we go. Just complete satisfaction. And, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, they are content with what they have, and, and for the time being, they're going to rest there and, and just sit in that. And um, so the, the animals who... Uh, chew their cud, their, their ruminants. And I, I just wanted to take a quick sidebar. And, and then as I was um, looking up this, I was like, oh, this ties right into satisfaction. It's amazing how, how everything correlates. So thinking of rumination, there are many scriptures that talk about meditating on God's word, and the definition is very close to that of ruminate. Um, and so if, if you're like, okay, I'm not, I wasn't, haven't grown up on a farm, what is, what is rumination? So, you know, they refer to cows as having four stomachs, you know, goat and sheep might have a couple, and what is that? And they eat their food, and then they bring it back up and, and chew the, the cud, what it's called, and it, it further helps to break it down and digest it. And uh, so that, that's the rumination process, and, and it, it helps them to get as much nutrients out of that food as possible. It's much less efficient 
uh, to just eat something and, and have it pass through, and you might be losing some of, of the uh, nutrients in there. And, uh, you know, I'm not getting too far on a sidebar, but like power plants, you have the high-pressure steam uh, cycle that has the really hot, high-pressure water, and as that, as that goes through the turbine system, it'll, it'll cool a little bit, and they'll reheat it and put it back in at a lower pressure and, and still be able to extract energy out of that steam. And, and so that, that's kind of like a rumination process of, of getting as much energy out of uh, this uh, product as possible. So meditation on God's Word, rumination on God's Word is where we feed on it. So we read it and we hear it, and then afterwards we bring it back up and think on it again. And that process helps us to further digest God's Word and understand the application in our life. The more times we bring that passage back up, the more times we see applications in our own lives and how we can, we can put it into, into use. Uh, rumination on the scriptures is what David wrote about in many of his psalms. We see David referred to as a man after God's own heart. Part of this was his habitual meditation or rumination on God's word, and through that it changed his heart to be more like God's. Joshua 1.8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Meditation on the scriptures will lead to a way of success, and and, you know, here's just a few examples. Uh, if you have the pursuit of being wise, read a chapter out of the Proverbs every day. Ruminate on, on the Proverbs. If you are a ruler or a person in, in authority looking for understanding on how to lead others, then go and read Solomon, or, uh, Solomon uh, Samuel, Kings and Chronicles, and uh, you'll learn from the mistakes that, that they had and from the successes. <clears throat> if you're a missionary, uh, you can read and meditate on the book of Acts and see how Paul and Barnabas and Silas and, and the early church uh, spread the gospel. There are many other examples of how we can use Scripture in our own lives to help us to live faithfully for Christ. And much of that understanding of the scriptures comes when we ruminate or meditate on God's word. So coming back to satisfaction, the prophet Isaiah, he prophesied about those who continually labored for what does not satisfy. And Jesus quoted from this when he spoke during the Feast of Tabernacles. You can find that in John chapter 7. And it, it's similar to when Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. In Isaiah 55, starting at verse 1. <clears throat> come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Verse 2, why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me, hear me that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David, 
See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations <coughs> excuse me, that you do not know will hasten to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him when he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish <coughs> so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you. All the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the pine tree. Instead of briars will the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will not be destroyed. Going through that, verse 3 starts off, it says, to give ear to me that your soul may live. You know, listening to the Lord, that our soul may live. Verse 6 says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way and turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And then he goes on, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. My word goes forth and accomplishes what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And then the blessings begin. In verse 12, you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. And instead of a thorn bush, a pine tree will grow. So what is the only thing that truly satisfies? Surrendering your life and your will to God and your soul will be satisfied. I left out verse 2 when I was going through there because I wanted to come back to it now. It says, Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen. Listen to me. Eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. And the implication is there that the world is chasing after things that do not bring any satisfaction. But if they were to listen and really listen to God, you know, we mentioned that last week, not just being hearers of the word, but doers of the word. If they were to listen, really listen to God, surrender their life to God, and read his word, their soul will delight in the richest of fare. David also wrote about his soul being satisfied in Psalm 63. He says, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water. So you get this, this sense that this person's out in, in the desert and they're just looking for an oasis where they can 
where they can get water. And then David says, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you in the watches of the night. There's that rumination, that meditation. On my bed, I remember you. I think about you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. And David, he, when you uh, look in your, in your Bible, you'll see that he wrote this psalm in, in the desert of Judah. But when you, when you read it, you, you kind of get the feeling like he was at a church service or a camp meeting where, where the presence of God showed up and was real and tangible. God's presence was enough that his soul was satisfied. And he said here, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and glory. God's love is better than life, so what can we do but sing praises to him and how wonderful and marvelous he is? And I don't know if uh, maybe you guys have noticed this, but have you ever noticed how the world is striving to receive satisfaction with things that cannot satisfy the deepest longings of the, of the heart? And I think we've all been there at, at various times in our life. Uh, maybe you've been there before where you seem to have everything you want, but you found that you were still empty. It's only that living relationship with God that can truly bring about that satisfaction. You see it in commercials for just about every product where people are striving to get satisfaction. From sleep to pleasure, cars to luxury, when you break down almost every commercial you see, you get this underlying message of, if you just have this, you'll be satisfied. The, the Rolling Stones, uh, great philosophers, right? No, I'm just kidding. The Rolling Stones wrote a song titled Satisfaction. The man in the song is driving his car, listening to the radio, hearing information, whether it was news or some other programming, I don't know, but he cannot get satisfaction from that. Then he goes uh, and he tries the TV and he see sees a commercial, but he can't get satisfaction there. He resorts to sensuality and cannot find satisfaction there either. The chorus of the song is, I can't get no satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction because I try and I try and I try and I try I can't get no I can't get no the world is striving for satisfaction but alas comes up short every time John D. Rockefeller the world's first billionaire was asked with the question how much is enough to that he replied just a little bit more. Well, I don't think it was just a little, just a little bit more. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. The things of this world can never bring the satisfaction that comes from knowing God. David wrote much about being satisfied or what brings about uh, satisfaction in Psalm 17. 
I, in verse 6, he says, I call on you, O God, for you will answer me. Give ear to me, hear my prayer. Show the wonder of your great love. Who save You who save by your right hand those who take refuge in you from their foes. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who assail me, from my mortal enemies who surround me. Then down in verse 13, he says, Rise up, O Lord, confront them, bring them down, talking about his enemies. Rescue me from the wicked by your sword. O Lord, by your hand, save me from such men, from men of this world whose reward is in this life. I think that's a key statement that David says, from men of this world whose reward is in this life. We're, we're seeking a heavenly reward. You, you still the hunger of those you cherish. David goes on in verse 14. You still the hunger of those you cherish. Their sons have plenty, and they store up wealth for their children. <coughs> Excuse me. And I, in righteousness, I will see your face. When I awake, I will be satisfied with seeing your likeness. And David, we see in this psalm that David has this prayer for God to rescue him from his enemies. But what truly brings satisfaction to David? Is it when he sees the defeat of his enemies? No, it's it, he ends with he'll be satisfied when he sees God's form. When we reach the end of our days here on earth and we see the Lord, we will be satisfied, completely satisfied with being in his presence. And, you know, kind of turning the tables here a little bit, do you know that God desires to satisfy our needs as well? Remember back in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Jesus goes on to say that God knows the needs of creation and provides for them. So will he not do the same thing for you? Do you remember what he said after, instead of worrying about where our daily bread comes from? Matthew 6, 33 Jesus said, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek God. Seek after fulfilling his will in our lives and the particulars of life will be provided by God. Another thing that's really cool about this passage that Jesus taught is Back in the Old Testament, in Psalm 104, we find a very similar passage. And I, I love going through the, an Old Testament passage and finding where Jesus referenced it in the, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, or where, where the apostles referenced it. And so, uh, you know, we're not going to go... Uh, try to digest the entire uh, Psalm 104, but uh, so we're going to start at verse 24 for the sake of time. How many are your works, O Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is the sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things both large and small. There the ships go to and fro, and the Leviathan which you form to frolic there. These all look up to you to give them their food at the proper time. (laughs) 
These, verse 27, these all look up to you to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your, your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his work. For he who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke, I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as, as long as I live. May my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. <laughs> so I'm beginning to see a theme developing here about not worrying about the particulars of life and turning to the Lord and seeking him wholeheartedly worshiping the Lord for who he is and what he has done in our lives and in the world, meditating on his word and his nature. And so it, this thought came to mind, is it any wonder that God was upset with the Israelites when they grumbled at eating the manna in the desert all the time. You know, uh, verse 28 in Psalm 104 there said, when you give it to them, they gather it up. Speaking of the, uh, his creation, when you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. Were the Israelites not to gather up daily what the Lord had given them? You know, they, it, I, I see this being very similar uh, to, to what God had done with the rest of his creation. He's, he's taken his chosen people out of Egypt, and he says, here, I'm going to provide for you daily. Gather it up. And so were the Israelites not to gather up daily what the Lord had given them? And with that, they were to be satisfied with good things from God's own hand. Bread from heaven that fell as dew on the ground. And do you remember what happened when they tried to store a little extra away? The food would spoil. It's so interesting that even in the time of the wandering of the desert, God was trying to form a nation that was not worrying about daily provision, but rather living their lives as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation to the world. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and these things will be added to you as well. Remember Peter said in his first letter that we are to be a holy priesthood. Are we grumbling about the manna or trying to store up extra that will only spoil or be thrown away? I think God was speaking the same to the Israelites as he's saying to us today. Seek me, and in me you will find satisfaction for your soul. Your soul will be fed with food from the king's table. Don't worry about the particulars of life and striving to find satisfaction in them because in the end you are left empty. Only in God, only God can fulfill that deep longing need to be satisfied. And Isaiah 53, 11 says this, after suffering of his soul, speaking of Jesus, after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be, what word is there? Satisfied. 
By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. After Jesus' pain and suffering on the cross, he saw the light of life and was satisfied, knowing that there was now a way through him for us to be justified, and that we will one day see God face to face. Jesus provided a way for us to be reconciled back to the Father. Despite the pain and suffering that he went through, he was satisfied. So as we close here, are you striving to find satisfaction from things of this world and finding that you come up empty? Call out to the Lord and he will meet your need. And as Brandy and the worship team come forward, the altars are open. If you need somebody to pray with you, uh, we'll, we'll pray with you. If you want to just get alone with God, that's, uh, that's great. Just be alone with God and be satisfied in his presence. The only thing that can truly bring about a lasting satisfaction. And, you know, when I was thinking of the manna and how God provided for the Israelites and thinking of our own lives and that, and I was like, well, I guess satisfaction isn't really a, a new thing because the Israelites struggled with it. They wanted the quail, and we know what happened there. And then, I, as I was thinking about it this morning, it, the thought came to me, well, what about in the Garden of Eden? The Lord said, you can have from any tree, but just not this one. And so that issue of satisfaction has been with us from the beginning. It's, it's a struggle of not being satisfied with the Lord and being in His presence and what He has provided us. It's been a, a problem ever since the Garden of Eden. And, and there is the avenue where we can be truly satisfied through Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for all you have done in our lives. Lord, we thank you for the, the things that you give us, the things that bring us joy, But nothing can compare to the joy and satisfaction that can be found in being in your presence and knowing you personally. Thank you, Jesus, for providing that way that we can be justified and be, have a restored relationship with the Father. Help us to seek to be in your presence daily. And Lord, that, that we would further satisfy you in bringing others to that knowledge of you. You desire for that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Lord, we pray for our, our neighbors and our family members and, and co-workers, Lord. Help us to be salt and light in their, own, their worlds, Lord, that we can bring them the true satisfaction. A relationship 
and a, a, a living relationship with you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. As we uh, are getting ready to go home and dismiss, I wanted to leave you with the lyrics of a popular hymn that was written back in the 50s. And it was written with John chapter 4 in mind, in the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. And John 4:14 4, says, "Whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst." And Richard Blanchard wrote this, "Like the woman at the well, I was seeking for things that could not satisfy." And then I heard my Savior speaking, draw from my well that never shall run dry. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. The second verse is, there are millions in this world who are craving the pleasures earthly things afford. But none can match the wondrous treasure that I find in Jesus Christ, my Lord. That's right. That's right. And in verse 3, he writes, so my brother, if the things of this world give you hungers that won't pass away, my blessed Lord will come and save you if you kneel to him and humbly pray. Fill my cup, Lord. We lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up, and make me whole. Also, as we go about this week, on Tuesday, let's remember uh, Johnny and Lois's brother, Wesley. He's having surgery on, on Tuesday, bypass and a valve replacement. And so... Uh, continue to pray for him that he would have the strength and vitality uh, and that the surgery would be successful. Lord God, we thank you for this day. Lord God, fill our cup. Lord God, fill Wesley's cup, Lord. We just pray for the physicians and doctors and and those that will be involved with the surgery, give them wisdom. Grant Wesley peace, Lord, and, and energy, Lord, that his body may be renewed, Lord. We just pray this in your name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Go in peace. Amen.